Thank you for joining us on The Skeptic Psychic, where we delve into ancient societies, the ghosts, the paranormal, UFOs, all looking at it from the perspective of the true believer and from the skeptic perspective. Joining me, my partner, my co-host, my sibling, Kimber Rodriguez. Myself, I am Richard Gregg. And again, let's look into being the skeptic psychic. Hello, and thank you once again for coming to us from beyond the ether, or maybe not even the ether. This is the skeptic psychic. I'm here with my wonderful, smart, intelligent, friendly, brave, clean, and reverent sister, Kim. And she's got something to actually share with us tonight. Hey, how's it going up there? All right. It's 82 up here. Well, that's much cooler than it was last time we recorded. Yes. So I'm reading the new novel by James Patterson called The Shadow. Interesting. How is it? A couple of little complaints. One... I have always believed uh, is that Lamont Cranston is not the shadow. Okay. The shadow's name is Kent Allard. However, he has posed as Lamont Cranston. Interesting. And two, it, it's kind of set in a far-reaching future, in a dystopian universe. Ah, gotta love that dystopia. Yep. So what would you rate it? I hadn't finished it yet. That's just two minor complaints I have. Well, we have been watching a few paranormal shows. We recently subscribed to Discovery Plus. Oh, I have that. The Discovery Plus? Yes. I quit getting cable because all I would watch was the Travel Channel and a couple of others. So Discovery Plus was perfect for me. Mostly on the Travel Channel, all I like to watch are the paranormal shows. So I'm able to catch a good bit there, such as The Dead Files, um, Kindred Spirits, and a few others. There's one other that I want to check out um, with Josh Gates. It's called Expedition Back to the Future. That's actually pretty good. He gets with uh, Christopher Lloyd as a search for the missing DeLorean. Really? Another good show to watch on there is Destination Tonight. That's with Josh Gates as well. Uh, he started it during the pandemic. It's actually pretty much uh, him and a camera by himself behind a table dis discussing things. Really interesting. Oh, I'll definitely have to check that one out. I mean, I'm a big fan of anything that says Destination at the beginning of Destination Bigfoot, Destination Truth. Destination Fact or Fiction, Destination Just Gates, that sort of thing. Well, it's also good if it has Expedition in the title, because then it's usually dealing with Josh Gates, who's freaking awesome. Yes, love to sit back and have a nice little conversation with him. Yeah, he's one I definitely think I would enjoy meeting. So, shall we let everyone know what our topic is about this week? Bloody Mary is the girl I love. Bloody Mary is the girl I love. Bloody Mary is the girl I love. Now it ain't too damn bad. Thank you, Oscars and Hammerstein. Thank you. Now, imagine you're a 12, 13-year-old girl, and you're at your first slumber party. You are giggling, laughing, talking about boys. When one of your friends suggests going into the bathroom and summoning Bloody Mary, a little leery and afraid, but not wanting to stand out or show this to your friends, you hesitantly agree. All of you crowd into the bathroom huddled with the lights out and just one candle lit, and you proceed to call upon this mythological legend. Yes, tonight we will be discussing the legend of Bloody Mary and the different possibilities of what it could be, as well as more information on Bloody Mary in general. 
So, Richard, what would you like to share about Bloody Mary? First off, the drink itself, which contained uh, seven ingredients of vodka, tomato juice, Worcestershire sauce, black pepper, celery salt, Tabasco, and lemon juice. It was originally created by a bartender uh, by the name of Ferdinand Pete Padat at the King Cole Bar in the St. Regis Hotel in the beautiful town of New York. Now, some people have said that he named it after the Mary Queen of Scots. Other people have sworn up and down it was a Russian dissident's wife. From what I hear, the Bloody Berry is a pretty good drink, but I don't drink. Okay. It's the information I got on Bloody Mary, plus also the wonderful song by Richard Rodgers and Oscar Hammerstein. In all seriousness, tell me about the legend of Bloody Mary. Okay. Well, the research into Bloody Mary goes back to 1978, when Janet Lang Lois, spelled L-A-N-G-L-O-I-S, published an essay about the legend. It is believed that summoning the mirror witch, even at that time, was widespread throughout the U.S. There are several different ways in order to do this. Some say that you put soap on the mirror, say the name ten times while spinning around, and then stare into the mirror until something appears. Also, some people believe if you say Hail Mary seven times in front of the mirror in a dark room, you would see the image of Satan himself. Um, the way that I heard the story growing up was you go into a room with the mirror, turn off all the lights. This does work best in the bathroom. You say Bloody Mary several times. And while you're, again, saying this, you turn around ten times. Once you are done, you look at the mirror and she should be there. Now, I personally have never gotten through all ten times. Usually about two to three times in. We all would start screaming and run out. But I do have to say to this day, I do have an innate fear of being in a bathroom with the lights off. I don't know what it is, but I always get the feeling of somebody watching me over the shoulder, just about ready to reach out and touch me as I hurry up and run out and close the door or turn the light on very quickly. There are many different theories as to where Mary first came from. The first theory is that it could be Queen Mary I, also known as Mary Tudor. Mary took the throne in 1553, and she sought to return England to the Catholic Church. Through doing so, she persecuted hundreds of Protestants and received the nickname Bloody Mary. A little bit about her life. She was the only child of King Henry VIII and Catherine of Aragon that survives adulthood. Henry was frustrated by the lack of a male heir. So in 1533, he wanted to divorce Mary. I'm sorry, he wanted to divorce Catherine. However, the Catholic Church did not believe in divorce. So at that time, he broke away from the Catholic Church and started the Church of England. At this time, he married Anne Boleyn. When Boleyn gave birth to her first child, Elizabeth, she feared that Mary would pose a challenge to the succession of the throne. So she pressed for an act of parliament and declared Mary illegitimate. By doing this, it placed Mary outside the succession of the throne and forced her to be a lady in waiting to her half-sister. Because of this, Henry had his wife Boleyn beheaded in 1536 and married his third wife, Jane Seymour, who finally gave him the son Edward. Seymour insisted that the king make amends with his daughter, and he would only do so if Mary acknowledged him as head of the Church of England and admitted that his marriage to her mother was illegal. Under duress, she agreed. Although she did re-enter the royal court, her religious beliefs made her a rightening lot for conflict. As tension continued through the short reign of Mary's half-brother, Edward, who died in 1553 at the young age of only 15. When he passed, Mary challenged and successfully won dethroning the new queen, Lady Jane Grey, who was the granddaughter of Henry's younger sister and was placed on the throne in a secret agreement between Edward and his advisors. Mary took the throne as the first queen regnant 
and reinstated her parents' marriage. At first, she acknowledged the religious dualism of her country, but desperately wanted to convert England back to Catholicism. She knew that if she remained childless, the throne would pass to her Protestant half-sister, Elizabeth, and needed a Catholic heir to avoid the reversal of her reforms. So she married Philip II of Spain. However, she produced no children, and Philip, who was bored with his wife, spent little time in England, providing no part in the vast new world trade to the British crown. Meanwhile, the alliance with Spain dragged England into a military conflict with Spain. During this time, Mary did endure several false pregnancies, and it was thought she would have suffered from either uterine or ovarian cancer. She died at St. James Palace in London on November 17, 1558. Again, um, the reason that they thought that she was Bloody Mary is because she was responsible for so many deaths to Protestants when she was trying to convert back to Catholicism of the church. Basically, those sheep that did not agree with her were, um, were put to death. And so that gave her the nickname of Bloody Mary. Do you have any thoughts on Mary Tudor and her reign and England? Did you know that the uh, nursery rhyme, Mary, Mary, quite contrary, how does your garden grow with silver barrels and cockle shells and pretty maids all in a row is actually a derivative of Mary, Queen of Scots? Uh, yes, but this is... Mary, Queen of Scots is Mary Tudor. No, Mary, Queen of Scots, is Mary Stuart, who was the first Queen of Scotland. Hmm. I know they do continually get confused, but it was two different queens. Okay. I am so sorry. <laughs> no, you're fine. Um, that is something that is very, as I mentioned, they do get confused for each other quite a bit, um, as I think they reigned pretty much around the same time. It's just Mary, Queen of Scots, was Queen of Scotland. Mary Tudor was Queen of England. But they did rule about the same time. Now, yes. why don't you tell us a little bit as to what the legend has to do with mirrors? Why is it that people think that they can see her ghost or that her ghost can come through the mirror? Okay. Now, this is the folklore of Bloody Mary. It's a legend of a ghost conjured to reveal the future. Originally, uh, you were actually on Halloween night, look into the glass, say her name ten times, and she will reveal your husband. Now, other things, when you've called her name, you may see your death, or actually the face of the Grim Reaper. Supposedly, when you're doing the whole Bloody Mary thing, you're actually doing this act called Catrol a promancy, which is a divination using a mirror. Now, we can go deeper into the whole uh, wonderful story of what exactly it does mean when looking in the mirror. When a person dies, according to Eastern European and Jewish traditions, all the mirrors must be covered. The belief in that is that uh, mirrors themselves are soul stealers. It goes back to the Greek myth of Narcissus. When he saw his own reflection in the water, falls in love with it and dies. Also, devils and demons can uh, enter through uh, mirrors to attack people. Now, when a person dies and you know they cover all the mirrors, one of the legends is if a corpse sees itself in the mirror, the souls of the dead will have no rest or it will become a vampire. A corpse also seeing themselves in the mirror will draw bad luck upon the household. And, of course, you know, Coyote himself covered all the exits to the outside when it came to people dying. So they were, once they were gone, they were gone. Another folk belief is that when you look in a mirror and someone dies, it's kind of a death omen. They should be covered in a sick room because if the soul is weakened, it's more vulnerable to be possessed during an illness. Now, when you have a haunting situation in your house, if it goes into, you know, Unpleasant spirit activities, investigators, uh, including lay uh, demonologists, may recommend the removal or covering of mirrors. So that way, any type of negative influence for the person will be able to uh, depart from there. 
or it's easier to cleanse without having that exit being in there. Now, interesting, we had a topic earlier about the Warrens. One of their famous cases, uh, they did go and investigate a gentleman by the name of Oliver B., who's a 45-year-old man in New Jersey who purchased a mirror for the purpose of casting spells and curses on others. Naughty, naughty, Oliver. You know, first he learned uh, to see uh, images in the mirror by spending long periods gazing in the mirror with intense concentration, much practice. He could state whatever he wanted to see, and the images were clear. He learned how to see the future situation for himself. Then he began picturing images of people he didn't like or had wronged them. And then he decided he was going to will something bad to happen with the help of the demons he summoned. The scene played out in the mirror and came to pass with physical reality. Eventually, poor Oliver's magic backfired up. The bad things that he was giving to other people began happening to him. In addition, demons invaded his home and included an unpleasant disturbances such as footsteps, heavy breathing, door openings by themselves, levitations, unearthly howlings in the night. And after a week of the terrifying phenomenon, Oliver contacted the Catholic Church. And of course, the Catholic Church referred them to Ed and Lorraine. Ed undid the ritual that Oliver had done repeatedly by forming it backwards. This stopped the oppression and nullified the mirror's magical powers. The uh, mirror itself is in the Museum of Possessed Possessions currently. Interesting. We haven't actually posted that Warren episode yet, but be looking for that in the future. We should have that up within the next few episodes. Hello, this is Future. We have an episode of Ed and Lorraine. The future. The future. Did you hear something? No. I think I was having a prophetic vision. The future. Well, at least it wasn't the past. The future. Okay. Another legend of Bloody Mary is thought that she was a witch named Mary Worth. Not the comic strip, Mary Worth. No, this is before the comic strip. Okay. This is only a myth and a legend. There's actually never been any proof found that this witch ever lived or where she's from. But according to the legend, she lived in a forest in a small cabin and was known around the local village for selling herbal remedies. And because of this, people thought she was a witch. However, there was also something very sinister about her. So people were worried that she would either curse their livestock or themselves. And even the local Wiccans would not accept her into their covens. Do you say Wiccans or Wiggins? Wiccans. I'm being serious. I'm... Wiccans. W-I-C-C-A-N-S. Okay. After a while, small girls started to go missing. And though she denied all knowledge of the girl's disappearances, the families were suspicious as she was starting to appear more feminine and youthful to the eye. There's a story of a miller's daughter who was captivated by a mysterious noise that only she could hear. Her mother was very frightened and called for her husband to come help her as the daughter started to walk away. They were shouting at her to come back, but it was as though she could not hear them and as if she was almost following an unseen spoken force. When they got closer, they noticed that Mary Worth was standing in a clearing next to a huge oak tree. She was holding a wand and pointing it at the miller's home. It was almost glowing with an unnatural light, and the daughter was headed straight for the light. Once others noticed just what Mary was doing, they set upon her with pitchforks and guns. She realized that everyone from the village knew what she was, so she broke the spell and made for the forest. So how did she die? How did she die? I'm about to tell you. One of the farmers had loaded his gun with silver bullets in the event that Mary ever decided to turn her attention towards his daughter. The farmer fired his gun and shot her in the hip. As she went down, the townspeople caught her kicking and thrashing and screaming as they tied her to a stake and a bonfire was promptly lit 
so that they could make sure the witch was gone for good. As she burned, she set a curse upon the villagers and told them that if they ever dared to utter her name in a mirror, she would be back for them. Her spirit would return to wherever they summoned and exact her revenge. After Mary passed, the villagers with the missing children went to the village and returned to Mary's home. They did a proper search and found what they were looking for. Rows and rows of unmarked graves. It seemed that she had been using the blood of the children to make herself more youthful. Again, there is no records of Mary Worth ever living. This is just a myth and a legend. The legend that I heard growing up was that she was a bride who was jilted on her wedding day. Since she was upset being jilted, she took a pair of scissors and locked herself into the restroom. She used the scissors to cut herself up and died. When she died, her soul entered the mirror, as you were saying about the, um, the religious belief about mirrors and trapping the souls and so on. Um, so that's what I heard. Now, what is your feeling on the fact of the teenage or preteen adolescent obsession of doing the Bloody Mary ritual? Do you think the reason why they don't go all the way through it is because they panic and uh, build them up to a scare or what? Definitely. I think that um, from personal experience, um, all the, like, as I mentioned before, all the times that me and my friends have tried to do it, we have freaked out. I have heard supposedly stories of people who have completed the ritual and have seen her. I personally don't believe she exists. Even though, as I mentioned, I do have this innate fear of the bathroom in the dark. <laughs> mm-hmm. It is a illogical fear because I truly do not believe that this spirit does exist. I think it's just something that girls make up at slumber parties to scare each other. Although I did have an incident in the bathroom one time. It was in fifth or sixth grade, and we were at recess. We were all joking around that we were going to go do Bloody Mary and we were trying to get a bunch of people together to go do it. In the meantime, me and two other friends went into the bathroom. One of them went to go use the toilet and while we were waiting for her, the second one was telling me the story of what she called the little green man. Now, I know this wasn't Bloody Mary, but it's along the same lines. Basically, she says that according to this legend of the little green man, you say the little green man 10 times, and at the end you say, let's see what you can do in the bathroom. So she did this. Right after she said, let's see what you can do in the bathroom, the other girl flushed the toilet. So we laughed and we thought, you know, that was really funny that she flushed the toilet right after she said, let's see what you can do. So we assumed that's what he could do. We go out, get about 10 other girls together. We're all going to go into the bathroom and call Bloody Mary. We go crowding into the bathroom. And there's this mob of these preteen girls at the entrance of the bathroom. Some trying to get out, too scared to actually go through with it. Others trying to hold on to them and keep them in so we can do it. Seeing this mob, I step back because I don't want to end up getting hit or pushed or kicked or whatever. So I'm standing about two to three feet away from the mob and about two feet from the wall behind us. Next thing I know, I go flying up against the wall. And I hit it pretty hard to make a loud bump, swear that everybody in the mob stops and looks at me. I could not explain what just happened. I was far enough away from them that they couldn't have pushed me into the wall and I would have felt them push me. And I didn't stumble or trip and fall back into the wall. It was as if I literally just flew back into the wall. After that, we told him the story about the green man and we all went running out of the bathroom and decided we were not going to try calling Bloody Mary that day. Have you any stories to share with Calling Bloody Mary or anybody that you know of that has tried it, what they've experienced? 
uh, I have seen girls running out of the bathroom trying to do the Bloody Mary ritual, and they get to maybe, I'd say, seven or eight uh, calls for it, and someone screams. It's like uh, the scene from the Marx Brothers at the opera, where the door opens and you see everybody kind of rolling out, you know, 15, 20 people. But still, it's five or six uh, preteen girls all screaming at the top of their lungs, and some of them crying, some of them laughing, you know. Usually it's like, did you guys do it? No, oh, we got scared. That's pretty much what I've seen as far as people doing it. Like I said, I have heard tales of people who've actually gone through with it and supposedly seen something, but I have never personally witnessed it. Because every time that the people that I was with had tried it, we all chickened out. Either we didn't even start saying it, or maybe we got like two or three out and then we all ran out. Yes. Basically, you kind of build yourself up to, you know, that group fear factor. Exactly. As far as Bloody Mary and pop culture, there have been several references to her. There are the Urban Legends Bloody Mary film, which came out in 2005, and is an installment of the Urban Legends series. Mm -hmm. In 2006, they made a movie called Bloody Mary. And in 2008, there was The Legend of Bloody Mary. The boys of Supernatural actually went after Bloody Mary in one episode. Mm -hmm. That episode was uh, directed by Peter Ellis. It is on the first season, episode five. And the premise is a game of Bloody Mary unleashes a ghost who lives in the mirror and kills by gouging out the eyes of her prey. They did have that as well as Ghost Whisperer in the third season. Um, there was a a spirit who was posing as Bloody Mary. Also on Charmed, which is a show that I've been watching. Uh, there is an episode of a demon who makes killers from different horror movies to come to life. And one of them is Bloody Mary. Lady Gaga has a track entitled Bloody Mary on her second album, Born This Way, where she mentions her by name. Um, so... As I mentioned, this is a very popular legend that has been around for decades. And it's still as popular today as it was when we were kids. What are your thoughts? I know you asked me if I believed that there was a bloody... Do you believe there is one? No, I don't. Do you believe it's something that was just made up to scare young girls? No, I think it was a cautionary type of tale. Explain. Okay, basically, there is actually a practice called Keto Pranoxmi, uh, or Eno, uh, excuse me, my uh, Latin is not that good. But it does kind of deal in trying to see visions or things coming through, uh, you know, meditating through a mirror. And so, basically, uh, it's kind of a, a divination by using a mirror. Again, you know, if you don't know what you're doing, you may uh, pull in something you don't want using this type of situation. It comes all the way back from the ancient Greeks, as well as been known in ancient Russian folklore. I have heard of that divination. Don't they also use water? Yes. Or basically anything with a reflective surface can be used for this? Mm-hmm. Yes. My main thing is, like you said, be careful what you wish for, because even if there's not an actual Bloody Mary, you could possibly be bringing in something not wanted. Because according to legend and many beliefs, the mirror can be used as a portal to invite things in. I would recommend not trying this. Definitely don't try this alone, because you never know what you may bring out. Don't try this at home. Let's let the experts to do what they need to do. Yes, don't try this at home. Try it in a public bathroom. Just kidding. <laughs> Just a joke. Yes. For all you know, that, that toilet flush in the far side may just be the guy that had to go really bad. And the faucet turning on by itself, well, he's got to wash his hands <laughs> afterwards. <laughs> at least we hope he does. Right. Yes, you know, 
public safety uh, would wash your hands while after using the restroom, okay? Yes. You'll never know what dirty spirits may be roaming around. Definitely. That, that is a good, good cautionary tale. <laughs> yes. So do you have anything else you would like to add about Bloody Mary this week? I do, in fact. Okay. Bloody Mary is the girl I love. Bloody Mary is the girl I love. Bloody Mary is the girl I love. Now ain't that too damn bad. Now ain't that too damn bad. Again, thank you, Rogers and Hammerstein. Okay. And as we close the book on that, I just wanted to end it on a little bit of humorous note, because it does kind of get a little bit dark. Agreed. So, uh, any uh, websites you... uh, podcast you recommend um or tv shows for that matter there is a facebook group i'd like to give a shout out to it was started by a good friend of mine jackie gardner and the name of the facebook group is learn about ghosts and this is a group that you can come and talk about spirits and things that you've seen or heard and get other people's opinions and thoughts upon them. A great bunch of people in this group. Uh, We started out at another message board back in the early 2K, and we have now gradually made our move over here to Facebook. Again, that's Learn About Ghosts. Check it out on Facebook, and I'll leave a link below. Anybody you would like to recommend this week? Uh, well, I actually would like to recommend a TV show. It, it's hosted by uh, Dave Schrader of Darkness at the Edge of Town. Uh, it's called The Holster Files. It's uh, on the Travel Channel, or actually, it's also now on Discovery Plus. Him and his team are going back and researching and re, uh, reinvestigating cases done by what we would consider one of the first ghost-busting parapsychologists by the name of Hans Holzer. Uh, Hans Holzer, from the early 60s on up until his death, went about the world researching such cases. He was born January 26th, 1920, and he died 26th of uh, April, 2009. He died at 89 years of age. Such cases as uh, the Amityville Horror is one of his famous cases. And they basically go back and uh, open up his case files and go into his thing. They are talking about doing a third season, but the last uh, season was in 2019. So if you ever get a chance, it is on Discovery Plus right now. Check out the Holzer Files. That's H-O-L-Z-E-R. Awesome. We'll definitely check that one out. I've heard of it, but I hadn't had a chance to actually sit down and watch it. So I will definitely be looking into that one. If anybody else has anything that they'd like to recommend, you can reach us at our email, info at skepticpsychic.com, or through our website, skepticpsychic.com. Leave us somebody that you would like to recommend, and we'll definitely check them out. Or if you'd like to hear something discussed on our show, again, send us a message and we'll definitely look into discussing that on the show as well. Anything else you'd like to add this week? Oh, well, actually, uh, the song that I sang at the beginning, uh, Bloody Mary, is from the uh, wonderful Broadway show called South Pacific. And the character Bloody Mary was based on a Tonkinese woman. Her real name was Emile de Becquet. She was a uh, culprit planter that he knew well in Espiritu. Yes, there it, there was such a person as Bloody Mary. Thank you, the Observer. I'll send that link to there. Okay. Any other things you want to say today? The only other thing I'd like to add is definitely check us out on Apple Podcasts. Or you can also listen to us on YouTube or Facebook. Definitely leave us a review. Let us know how you think we're doing. And we will read the review on air. May I say five stars? 
We'd prefer five stars, but... Five stars? That's the most stars you can always give. Just let us know how you think we're doing. If there's anything you think we need to improve on, let us know. If you like what we're doing, let us know. And again, we will read the review on air. If you'd like to remain anonymous, just let us know. Yes. And at this time, I think it's time that we close the casket on Bloody Mary for this week. Don't break it, just close it. (laughs) I broke the mirror, man. Seven years, man. I can't believe it. Oh, no. Future. Everybody, have a great week and have pleasant dreams. Unpleasant nightmares. Good night. Good night.